I prepared a visual presentation uh, to walk you guys through what money, myth and mystery, or what I mean by money, myth and mystery, so trying to explain what money is from a perspective of something that we're familiar with, which is the financial crisis. And um, despite the financial crisis, uh, this thing that I'm going to start with has not changed. Since the 80s, Income inequality has increased dramatically. Uh, incomes have gone up uh, a very large amount for everyone. If you look at it in the aggregate, incomes have gone up. But only if you go into that, um, only a few sectors, only a few um, lucky people uh, actually saw their in incomes increase by a lot and everyone else, probably us, um, our incomes stayed more or less the same. So. In other words, income uh, inequality has been uh, rising dramatically. Um, and there's been uh, studies to, to see you know, who's uh, gaining these uh, income gains or to whom uh, they are going to. And uh, the 1%, I think everyone's familiar with that term by now, uh, they're dominated by people working in the financial sector and CEOs and, if you combine the two, CEOs working in the financial sector. They make the most. Uh, interestingly, you'd expect that with the financial crisis and banks crashing and all that thing, that would actually reverse because financials are making lots of money and then the banks crash. Actually, uh, this is from uh, two weeks ago. Uh, from This is uh, 2009 to 2011. The 1% 1 um, captured 121% of all income gains during that period. So you probably are wondering how is that possible? How can you capture more than the total? Uh, it's because the other 99% lost 0.4% from their incomes. So something's wrong. Um, and I'll try to explain uh, what's going on from some re research that I've been doing for the last five years. I've been trying to understand what money is. Um, I graduated in a master's degree in banking and finance. I'm currently doing a uh, PhD on uh, monetary economics, specifically trying to figure out what is money. And what I've learned in the meantime is that the main problem is that we uh, start from the wrong... Um, well, starting points. Uh, our assumptions are wrong. I'll show you some myths that most of us think are true. One of them is that money is a capitalist or a free market thing. Actually, if you look at that from a historical point of view, it's completely ridiculous. It's the other way around, and I hope to show you. Uh, first, there was barter in Nederlands Ruilhandel. Yeah, first, people were bartering, and then suddenly we invented money. Yeah, and things were awesome. Um, Another myth is that banks are supposedly using your money, borrowing savers' money, to allow other people to uh, borrow that money and invest in productive businesses and so on. That's also a myth that's completely not true. Um, if you've heard of this fractional reserve lending, uh, then, uh, well, it's also a myth. Um, if you haven't heard of it, don't worry about it. It's a myth. Um, and this one's also a myth. Go governments, supposedly, they can run out of money. I'll show you that that is also from a historical point of view, uh, completely ridiculous. And these myths are the reason why, um, if you start from the wrong starting point, you can't come to an understanding of what money is. Uh, my basic thesis, so I'll get to the point and then substantiate it. My basic thesis is that throughout, his throughout history, as today, money is always and everywhere a government phenomenon with apologies to the late Milton Friedman for uh, paraphrasing a quote of his. I'll quickly start to, uh, I'll quickly try to make this um, obvious and then go into the historical point. If, so, uh, a lot of people wonder, why does a 50 euro note, a piece of paper, why does it have so much value? Uh, because it's just a piece of paper. And the reason is because it isn't just a piece of paper. Because uh, if you want to keep your house, if you want to keep your car, then at the end of the year you need that specific piece of paper to pay your taxes. Otherwise, it will be impounded. Um, if you want, in Belgium, uh, education for your children, waste disposal, then you need that kind of piece of paper because you can't pay for your children's educa education with anything else. And also, uh, if you... Um, <laughs> Go over the speed limit and you get caught. Uh, there's two ways of getting around that. Uh, there's two ways of settling that. 
One is you hand over a 50 euro piece of paper or you go to jail. So the idea that that 50 euro piece of paper is just a piece of paper is completely not true. In order to uh, function in this society, you must have it. And that's what makes it money. Um, just to be clear, I use government in a very broad sense. Gro government could also be a tribal council. Uh, government could be temple officials in the Me uh, Mesopotamian era. Uh, the Egyptian pharaoh could be your government. City council, most of the people in the Middle Ages never had any contact with their king. Their authority was the council of the city that they lived in. Uh, in Rome, that was the Senate. And... Of course, in the medieval period, I choose a medieval king with a bit of notoriety because it's that notoriety that makes money money. So, uh, this is the official definition. Uh, well, fortunately, this is true, uh, but there's one problem. Uh, it's actually quite useless as a definition because anything could match that or not match that. I'll show you. These are examples, historic examples of money throughout the ages. Uh, but they were money then and not now. Or maybe they were money to some people, but not to us or other people. Uh, carry shells, Chinese, leather straps used to be money. That's my favorite kind of money over there. Yap stones, awesome. Obviously not very useful for day-to-day -day transactions, <laughs> but it is real money if you understand what it is. It's still used today uh, on the Yap Island in the uh, Pacific Ocean, I think it is. Um, the Maasai used cattle as money. Grain was very important in Mesopotamian and uh, Egyptian times. And this, surprisingly, is from uh, sort of the more modern era. In the 16th and 17th century, the states, American states of Virginia and a couple of around them, used tobacco as money. So you pay your taxes in tobacco. So then the question is, why tobacco then? Why not now? Why can't I pay my taxes with tobacco now? So. The question is, what's the underlying trait that turns this into the definition of money? What's behind that? What makes that true for some things now and other things back then? A lot of myths. You have to start with this one. This is the liberal creation myth. I don't mean that in a negative way. It's just how it is. A lot of our myths come from the liberal period. I'll try to substantiate that later. But the idea is that, you know, uh, barter, uh, I have grain and you're a fisherman. I'd like a fish, but maybe you don't need grain. Problem, nobody can trade. That's the assumption. Um, but that means that people didn't have the idea of, you know, this is the, the alternative. Um, I have grain, I need a fish. Maybe you don't need grain, but you're going to say, I have the fish. It's going to be bad in three days, so here's a fish. Keep it in mind, owe me one. And later, I might go, you know, remember I still owe you a fish? Uh, I have some grain, would you take the grain instead? So this is actually how it worked. Um, the myth implies that people traded and then immediately wanted to settle which is completely opposite to how people lived in early communities. Even now, um, anarchist communities are the complete opposite of wanting to spot trade. Anarchist communities share, even today. That's how it works in small communities. Uh, and if you don't need to have immediate settlement, then you don't need money. And you also don't need barter. What you're doing is keep track, keeping track of what people did for you and doing things in return. This still exists today. Imagine the situation. Three, uh, five friends are going to the movies and um, they have a beer before the movie. First guy buys a round. Mm -hmm. La la la. Drink the beers. Second guy buys a round. Third guy buys a round. And then it's time to go to the movie. What will not happen is that the other two will then reach for their wallet and go like, how much do I owe you? How much do I owe you? How much do I owe you? That's not how it works. What will happen is that we'll keep that in mind for next time, and then they, guy, uh, they buy the beer. So people are keeping track of their debts, debts even today. Uh, there was such a thing as immediate settlement. If you're trading with a person that you were no, never going to see again, that's when you want immediately something in return. But this is barter. This is real handle. I give you gold because you give me some stuff, and we part, and we never see each other again. But that was 
relatively rare and especially inside communities that simply did not happen. Um, however, like with the friends going to the, to the bar and having some beers, you can imagine the situation where it's always the same guys buying the round and the other guys saying, I'll buy next time. Especially in larger communities and cities, you have the problem, you need to start keeping track of that. Um, tally sticks, uh, kerfstokken in Nederlands. Um, we still have that expression, iets op je kerfstok hebben. Um, they were the first, or the, at least the oldest recorded uh, way of keeping uh, track of uh, debts, keeping record. Um, the oldest discovered example is 35,000 years old. That's important because agriculture and the first settlements only appear 11,000 years ago. So even before people settled down, they were already keeping track of each other's debts. Um, when the agricultural revolution happens, these clay coins start to appear everywhere. Well, everywhere. There's not a lot of uh, stuff uh, but from that old that have been dug up. But um, there's a, a match there. Uh, the clay coins start appearing when people start settling down. And uh, they use these coins, or well, coins, uh, they use these tokens to uh, represent different things. For example, uh, bottom left, it sort of looks like the head of a cow with six dots uh, printed on that uh, token. Well, it's probably something that was used to keep track of six cows, I don't know. Uh, for everything that people used, they had different shapes. And that was a way of keeping track of, I still owe you, imagine six cows and two sheep. You take these tokens, tie them on string, and then you had a physical record that you could keep. This is very interesting because it's the origin of money, as far as people can tell. Um, in order to protect this, this collection of I still owe you that and that and that, so that nobody could tamper with it, people would encase it in a clay envelope. And uh, in order for people not having to break the clay envelope every time, uh, they would write on the clay envelope what was inside. But in order to do that, you have to mark one, two, three, four, five cows. And they would draw the picture of the head of a cow. But then you also had to mark witnesses. When was it? Under which moon? Yada, yada, yada. So you get all these symbols appearing, and that's the origin of writing, is just keeping debt, um, accounting. Uh, by 3300 BC, in Uruk, I think it was, in Mesopotamia, this developed into a full language, and 1800 years later, it develops into something that we would recognize as cuneiform language. Uh, you still have the inside letter and the outside envelope uh, providing a untampering, untamperable match. You can't tamper with what's inside, you always know, you can verify what the, the transaction was. Uh, when people discovered these clay tablets in cities like in Mesopotamia, Uruk, Babylon, uh, they started you know, trying to uh, translate them by 1850-something that worked, and people learned that most of these tablets that were found were simply keeping track of simple transactions, not uh, letters, messages, just keeping track. This guy got that much for keeping uh, watch over the sea coast. That's a, a specific example. Now, from shekels to denarius. The shekel is not money. The denarius is money, and I'll show. I'll try to show you the difference. A shekel used in Mesopotamia, 3000 BC. Originally, it's a uh, unit of weight of grain, and uh, people pay taxes um, to temples, to kings, to local officials, whatever. Uh, but these taxes were not necessar necessarily paid in grain. It was just a weight, and uh, the temple provided uh, conversion rates for anything else that you would be able to pay with. So if you were a fisherman, you could still pay your taxes. Um, the denarius is a different creature. It's a Roman coin, and we have records of this from the Fiscus Judaicus, so uh, the taxation system of the Romans in the province of Judea, so uh, the, the where the Jewish people uh, paid a tax of two denarii per person. Um, but it had to be the denarius. You had to pay with the denarius. And uh, no, nothing else was accepted. 
Uh, interestingly, interestingly, the value of a denarius was actually more than the gold value of the coin. If you paid with gold coins, that was, of course, the gold value of the coin. But a denarius gold coin ranged in value from 1.6 to 2.85 times the metal value. The premium is, of course, the monetary value of the coin. Uh, this is <laughs> the liberal myth of how people, most people think money works like this. There's an economy, there's p public servants that the emperor would like to have services from, scribes and stuff. Private contractors can do whatever. Uh, they're um, mainly soldiers, basically. And everyone else. And they're having this community and people are paying each other, yada, yada, yada. And when the emperor sees a whole bunch of goals, like oh, asterisks and obricks in front, um, uh, charging in, he needs money, so he taxes and borrows the people and then spends the money. That's the myth. This is not true. Um, for example, from the Bible, uh, not coincidentally in Judea as well with the Romans, um, there's a specific uh, phrase that says, return to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. So people were aware that the money was coming from the emperor, not from the market. So this is how it really worked. You have people recording their debts, and then the emperor decides to spend with coins with the head of the emperor on. And uh, these coins would enter circulation, but it's interesting, the, 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 the main point is, the emperor only pays certain people, but he taxes everyone. So all the people have to get these coins, and the only way to do that is to offer services to the other people that have the coins. Then the emperor taxes, the coins are taken out again, and this is how the system works. This is how it circulates. Um, the key element of money is that the government um, declares it to be the payment for taxes, government services, and fines. And, of course, the threat of, and if you can't pay, then, and so on. Um, it doesn't have to be the government that creates the money, which is how even stone can be money. If the tribal council says, if you marry the daughter of another family, then you must transact one of these stones, then you need the stones, and then the stones become money. So where's the confusion coming from? Uh, in 1776, 1776, liberalism starts to appear, and it's against the state monopoly of mercantilism. Uh, mercantilism means the state controls everything, the economy, everything. A quote from Noam Chomsky, it's not the same as capitalism. 100 years later, Marx shows that we're still not there yet, liberalism, fine, but the capitalist state is protecting the monopoly of the producers. Um, then you get the 20th century and monopolies are broken down. Austrian school, Hayek in 78 writes that money needs to be denationalized. So obviously people still realize that government and money were still very close. Uh, strangely enough, Reagan, Thatcher, Verhofstadt, uh, they kind of do what um, Marx wanted to happen, break down the monopolies. But, um, of course, the school books were written in this period, and it's not very popular in a liberal time to write that free markets, uh, that the government creates money, so free markets had to create money. Uh, we're now in a catch-22 situation. We've uh, liberalized a lot, but we've gone too far. We've liberalized money and made bank debt the uh, the money of our system, but there's a problem now. Most of the monopolies have been broken, but the bankers have a free ride. They make money when, it go when the economy goes well, and the, they make money when the economy crashes, when the financial system would crash, because the government can't function without the money system. It has to pay its uh, teachers, politicians, uh, judges, police. The government can't function with without this money system. So when things go wrong, the government has to save the financial system, and the bankers get the money again. This is the too-big-to-fail uh, situation. So that's why, if you look at who's getting very, very, very rich, it's one group of people, and it's understandable why. The challenge, and this is for the future, this is where I'll stop. Um, the challenge, I don't have an answer yet, <laughs> uh, but it's, it's an open challenge to everyone. How do we take money out of the hands of these um, privileged bankers without either, you know, 
there's two solutions uh, or two extremes. Austrian is money cannot be in the hands of government, so we must take it completely away. Fine, but then find a solution that where we can allow the financial system to crash if it's mismanaged uh, without taking the government that or the government's function down with it. Keynesian solution, that's the other way around. Maybe, maybe money needs to be part of the... the uh, the government system again, like the government runs the police and courtrooms. Uh, or maybe there's another solution. Um, I don't know, but we need an answer to this. Thank you. <laughs>